here's a, a moment of honesty. Last week was New Year's. How many of you guys legitimately stayed up till 12 o'clock to watch the ball drop? Yeah, pretty much everyone like that's young. I, we, Courtney had this great design. Like typically we've been the parents that like try to put the kids to bed fairly early, not too late. But this year we, we had attempted to keep the kids awake and um, and Courtney had this plan that she had these balloons for like each hour and each hour one of the kids would pop the balloon and there was a bag of <coughs> games or whatever else. And man, we started off so strong. Like I think it started off at like six o'clock maybe thereabouts. Man, and we were cruising. I mean, six o'clock was good. Seven o'clock was good. Eight o'clock, we were still rolling pretty good. About nine o'clock, started kind of dwindling a bit. By 10 o'clock, Courtney made a deal with the kids to just pop all the balloons and open up all the bags and shout. We took sparklers outside and said, Happy New Year, and then we all went to bed. So it was, it was a good, it was a good um, time for us. Um, I hope that you guys uh, had a, an enjoyable time too. Hey, if you guys have your Bibles, um, I would like to encourage you guys to open them up to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. Maybe this morning you, know, you forgot your Bible on your way to church. No worries. We got Bibles here if you'd like to borrow or keep them. So if you don't have a Bible, you forgot your Bible, need to borrow a Bible, whatever, would you just lift your hand up? And we got some guys in the back that will bring you a Bible that you can, that you can keep or borrow or whatever it may be. Um, but we're going to be in 1 Samuel. And for those of you, maybe, um, I know we have a couple of visitors. Um, our normal practice is we just go verse by verse through books of the Bible that's kind of how we operate, how we roll, and we don't necessarily put a time marker. I, I don't typically put a time marker on how long we'll be in a particular um, book. Uh, the idea for us this year is we're going we're gonna to start in 1 Samuel, and when we're done with 1 Samuel, we're going to go into 2 Samuel. Um, they, they're both going back into its original text. It was, it was one one book, and so um, we're just going to kind of keep rolling through it. So that more than likely is going to be the entire 2018 year for Redemption Hill, and probably bleed over into 2019, Lord willing. It's going to be good. You know what, I, I love I love this um, First and Second Samuel for a lot of reasons. Um, I think for me, you know, my, my favorite character in the Bible is David, aside from Jesus. I always got to preface that. But David's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Always has been since I was a little guy. And so, man, we get to see a lot of uh, David. And, um, and we, get to see, or we get to read and talk about a lot of familiar stories. I mean, those of us who have maybe grown up in church or been around church for a while, I mean, we're going to see a lot of familiar stuff. And, and, um, and we're going to go back to kind of like seeing Jesus, hopefully, in... In, in the Old Testament. And so I'm excited. I, I really am excited about this this year and what the Lord's going to have for us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray and we're just going to get right into it, all right? Lord, I thank you for, uh, I thank you for, as, as Bonnie said, this faith family. I thank you for the, the chance that you've given us to come together this morning. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for each and every person who's here today. And Lord, I don't believe um, in happenstance. I don't, I don't believe in, in fate. I do believe in divine appointments. And I do believe that you are the one that brought us here today. Lord, I believe with all my heart that this is your inerrant word. And I believe that every time it's read every time it's spoken from that it will not return void and so I believe what we're going to read and see today not through my words but through your words can connect to every single heart that's here today so Holy Spirit I ask for you to do your work I ask for you to to open up our eyes I, I pray that you begin to soften our hearts and allow us to hear your words Lord, I pray that you help us to see where your words here need to intertwine within our life. 
But I believe that this is a very applicable passage today to not just one or two people, but to all of us. Jesus says, I ask every single week, I pray, I beg that you give me your words, give me your heart, give me your passion for this passage. And may everything that we do, everything that I say, bring honor and glory to you and to you alone. So we look forward now to what is about to happen in your name. We pray. Amen. I was thinking as we were, as we were singing the songs, I, you know, I, I love how we, I mean, I, I don't probably brag enough on our worship team, but I love how we will we'll sing like newer songs, but then I love how we throw in like our, our hymns, our old hymns. Um, sometimes it's maybe a hymn that's been rearranged, I guess, to have more modern instruments placed into it, or they couple it into another, maybe worship songs or verses, whatever else. But, but sometimes we just go like straight, like old school, which we did with How Great Thou Art. Um, I, I grew up in a church, man. We had like the hymnals. Like we, man, you, you'd stand up and turn to page 265 and we're going to sing whatever. It is well with my soul. Right? We would sing it. And I remember those days. I, I'm, I, I, and I don't, I don't look back at those like, oh. But I, re I remember how awesome that was. I remember the, we'd have a choir. And it wasn't a big church. But we'd have the choir and we'd listen to them sing and, and everything. And as we were singing... How great thou art. I was, I was thinking, and I, I, don't, I don't remember the entire story. But if I recall correctly, the history behind that story, it, that song, is it began as a poem. And there was this German pastor who was out going for a walk. In the midst of his walk, this unexpected storm rolled through. And with the crashing of the lightning and the violence of this storm, he, 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 he took cover. And when the storm was over, like the, the, you could see like the devastation around. And as, as quickly as that storm came through and the, and the sound of the violence that the storm brought when the storm was over, there's this kind of this dull sound of nothing until he heard some church bells ringing. It was at that point that he was inspired to write this poem down. And, and, and you know, you think through those words like, it is well with my soul. Or not, it is well with my soul. How great thou art. I'm sorry, I just <laughs> mentioned the other song. <laughs> How great thou art. Um, sometimes we get in these this rhythm of life, we show up at church and we kind of go through the rhythms even within our church life and we sing songs because we're familiar with them and, 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 and sometimes the songs are easy to sing and sometimes they're not quite so easy to sing and sometimes if, if we're being honest, we, we can sometimes sing songs and we're not even really thinking about what we're singing. We just know the song so we sing it. And it can become real easy for us to say how great thou art. Especially Especially when life is good, right? Especially when everything seems to be going like our way, when things, the puzzle pieces are kind of going together the way we had hoped, the way we had planned, the way we had worked for. Like it's kind of easy to turn back and say, yeah, God, you are great. But when life doesn't go the way we had hoped for, the way we had planned, the way we had dreamed, to sit back and start singing how great thou art becomes more challenging, doesn't it? And that's what I'm so excited about today's passage in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Because this is a story, this is an event, as we read it, as we place ourselves into this story, man, we will, I, I think, all be able to identify with, like, today's main character, Hannah. If you guys recall, I, I believe it was over the summer, 
we went through the book of Ruth. You guys remember that? We spent four weeks. We went through it fairly quickly. One of the things I encourage us to do as, as we went through that story is to try and place ourselves in the midst of that story. And that's what I'm going to ask for you guys to do today. I'm going to ask you guys to, 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 to join me in this story as we go through this, uh, to, to try and, 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 and push everything aside that we're going through right now and to place ourselves in the story, to, to feel um, the emotions, to, to feel the struggle, and to feel the rejoicing in the end of this particular passage, all right? So let's, you know, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to try to do today is, is, is read a few verses, break down a couple little segments there, work through it, and then at the end try and wrap up some practical applications for us today, okay? So here we go. First Samuel chapter 1. The other good thing about going back to the Old Testament is all of a sudden we come back to all the crazy names, right? Hope, thankfully, today we get most of them done at the very beginning, all right? So here we go. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. First Samuel chapter 1, it says, And there was a certain man of Rathiam Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, and the son of Jerohoam, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth. Man, are you glad that we've gone to like John and Bill? And <laughs> <laughs> makes me so happy. Um, and Ephraim. <clears throat> and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. The name of the other was Peniel. And Peniel had children, but Hannah had no children. All right, so very beginning, okay? So we kind of get through this little lineage of, of, of different places, different people. And, and I don't want to... There's significance in that first verse, but, but, but for the course, of, for the allowance of us to get through what we need to get through today, we're going to kind of push through that first verse and we get into the second verse. The, the one name we need to clue in on the, in, first, in the first verse is Elkanah, who's the husband. Can we get to verse... Two, and we're, we're presented with his wives. Now, one of the things that we're going to see all throughout 1 Samuel, and we see it um, to a great extent throughout the Old Testament, is this idea of polygamy. And, and again, this isn't center stage. This isn't, this isn't the focal point of today. Um, but it is worth noting this, that, that, that sometimes people take this belief that, well, if it's in the Bible, that means it must be of God. And that's not the case here, because one of the things that we see, even though we see it to a great extent, even though we see um, great men of God or great women of God connected to it, one of the things that we always see whenever it's present is struggle and dysfunction. Okay? And so don't, don't think, well, just because it's here, that must be, it must be God saying, well, it's, it's okay. That's not the case, okay? And we'll, we'll touch more on that as it presents itself along the line later. But in this, what we do see is there are two wives. One named Hannah, who kind of becomes the focal point of, of this passage. And then his other wife, um, <clears throat> Peninnah. Okay? There's a problem that we see at the very beginning of this verse. Hannah does not have children. Peninnah does have children. Verse 3 says this, Now this man used to go up year by year from his country to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the, son, where the, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, <coughs> Hophni and Phineas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Verse 5, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, but the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't know all of our stories. 
And sometimes it's difficult for us to, to look at a passage in this day, in the age that we live in. Um, today, I don't know what the average size family is. It's probably like 2.3 kids. I'd hate to be that 0.3 of a kid, right? But I mean, that's probably what, what it is, right? Something like that. Um, back in these days, I mean, families were large. And we see this idea of her being barren. And this is kind of like the key thing for us to, to, to clue in here. The, the frustration that we see in, this, in these first seven verses that Hannah's facing. Really, there's this, this hopelessness of Hannah in these first seven verses, right? And, and the, the key being, she is not able to have kids. No longer, not able to, to have children. Today we think through that and we're like, man, that's like, it's sad. A lot of people have that. There's, there's several families that maybe have gone through that, but, but there's opportunities with adoption and things like that. And, but what we have to understand here is this, that in, in her day and age, in her time, like that's the way you could measure the value of a woman is if she were able to produce children, prim primarily sons. And if we think through this a little bit, I mean, there, there, there's, um, there's really kind of three reasons that, that, um, that I think that we can, that, 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 that were important for a, a woman to be able to have children. First, um, the people of Israel were um, working class type people. And so if you were to have children, those children could, could grow to become Laborers, They could grow to work on the family farm, okay? And if we think through this a little bit, we're like, if we understand that the more workers we have, then more than likely the, the, the bigger the crop that we can produce. And the bigger the crop we can produce, the more income that can come into the family. Right? And so with this idea, with this idea of children... Um, comes um, some security, it comes, it becomes um, value for the family. It allows them to, to build a legacy. And then also, you're talking about a day and age where there were no like 401k accounts for retirement. And so it would be left to the children to care for the parents. Israel, as a nation, was dependent upon growing families. Those, those children that would be born would one day grow to be workers that would produce income for the nation, but not just income, it would also uh, produce the means of providing a military. And so having children meant everything. If a woman were able to have a large family. She was honored. She was viewed as a hero. But if a woman could not produce children, she was viewed as worthless, insignificant. I mean, according to the laws of the day, the fact of a woman not being able to produce children was grounds for divorce. As you kind of read through the story, while it's not said, you can almost see there's this implication as we, as we see the way in which um, Elkanah um, relates with the wives. We can almost infer that this idea that more than likely Hannah was his first wife. And with the understanding over time that she couldn't produce children, he more than likely took on a second wife that could produce children. And so if we see, if you, got, if you read this, this idea, those first seven verses, we see this hopelessness of Hannah, but then we compound it with the other wife. And the other wife has kids, right? And, and, and you notice what, what takes place here? Um, in verse six, it talks about how she provoked her. 
she would provoke Hannah with this idea that I have the children. I am the woman and this family that is able to produce the security, that's able to produce the laborers, that's able to produce those who will bring in more um, um, financial security for our family. I'm the one that is producing the kids that will be the heirs to all of this. I'm the one who's producing the children who will care for us, or at least for me. And she was relentless, and it uses that word provoke. If you go into um, the original Hebrew, um, that, that word means like um, uproar. It's, it's, this, it's a word that was used to describe like a storm. In fact, this is the only place in the Old Testament that we see this word used not in reference to a literal storm. And so you guys see this? We have Hannah who's struggling with her reality. She's struggling with the things that she doesn't have. She's struggling with this idea of finding her significance. She's struggling with the idea of finding her security while the other wife is constantly harassing her with the fact that she's able to do all of that and she can't. So you guys, can we see like the tension going on in this family? As you get towards the end of verse 7, it gets to the point where Hannah is just weeping and crying. She's, she's so depressed that she's not even like eating. Because she's so consumed with what she doesn't have. What she thinks she needs. Verse 8, we see this... Um, it's an interesting, interesting verse because her husband, well, let's just look at verse 8. It says this, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? I mean, underline this, that last phrase there. Am, am I not more to you than ten sons? Listen, um, I, I think I think Elkanah is, is, a, is a, a good man. Earlier we, we when we're reading about him, we, we read about him going and taking sacrifices. It's, it's not it's not mentioned by happenstance that, that he would go to um, um, Shiloh and, and, and do this stuff. It, it's not happenstance that they just randomly throw in that he goes and visits Eli's two sons. Oh, part of the reason I believe it's, it's mentioned there, Eli's two sons were known to be crooks, were known to be wicked. But despite that, we still see this righteous man that goes and takes care of the things that he needs to do, that he goes and continues despite the wickedness, goes and worships God. Makes that a priority in his life, and not just his life, but his family's life. Okay, I think we see this righteousness. I mean, we, we see that, that he's a good man. I mean, when it came time to go to the feast, he would go and he would serve the family. He would give um, Penna and her, her children their portion. But, but did you guys pick up on when he got to Hannah, what he did? Like he went and he gave her a double portion. Like he could see that she's struggling. And so you see this, he's a, a good husband that's trying to encourage his wife. But, but notice here in that verse 8, he tries to do something. He tries to, to not just um, be a good husband, but he tries to offer up a different savior of sorts. As he sees his wife crumbling with all this, he, he turns to her and he says, I'll reread re verse 8. He says, Hannah, why do you weep? Why are you so upset? Why, why do you not eat? Why is your heart so sad? And he says, listen, am I not more to you than ten sons? Like, 
look, do I, am I not more valuable to you than the 10 sons? Like, like, like let that be, let, let you, you find your value, not in that, but find it in me, your husband. I love you and can't you see that, that I'm, I'm giving you the double portion and I, I do want to care for you and let me be the one that does that. Today, um, we, our society, struggles with where we find significance, how we obtain that. In Hannah's day, it was found in children and family. Our day, it's different. It's not so much probably while we do take pride in our children, but typically when we think of significance, we, we tend to, to view it more as maybe the job that we obtain or hope to obtain. Maybe it's the place in which we go to school. Now maybe it's um, a financial bracket that we're in or that we strive to get to. Maybe it's a, a neighborhood that we live in. I mean, wh whatever. There's a whole lot of fill in the blanks of where we think we can find our significance where we think we can find our joy, where we think we can find our peace, where we think we can find whatever it is we're looking for. And that's what he does to Hannah. He tries to offer himself. He tries to offer up their relationship. He tries to offer up maybe the romance in their, their, their relationship. And what we see is this idea of rather than going to the source, rather than, than trying to bring her to um, a relationship and, 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 and thrusting her to focus in on, on, on the Lord, we throw in other things. Other saviors that will lead us to frustration. That will cause us to feel empty and depressed and hurt, confused, unsatisfied. I think we see that even in marriages today. That rather than building um, a marriage on the foundation of God we, we attempt to build our marriage on the foundation of our love for each other but those of us who've been married long enough understand that love is sometimes can be viewed as an emotion and emotions change don't they I always whenever I've had a chance to have some premarital counseling and talk with people, I always try to remind couples that, that love is a choice. Yes, there are times of emotion. But love can't be viewed as a Hallmark movie, right? It's a choice that we have to make. And there are days in our marriage that we might not like each other, but we choose to love each other, right? But when the foundation is completely built upon the emotion of that love, the, cr the foundation crumbles as soon as there begins to be a frustration and as soon as somebody begins to be let down because ultimately what we end up doing is we exalt our spouse to be God. And as soon as they disappoint us, we're frustrated. It's one of the reasons why I think like in our day and age that we see such a, a, a massive addiction across the board between men and women, between youth and adults with pornography. Because it's our way of escaping the reality. And we can find comfort in that. Maybe for some that's not the, the comfort, but, but, but we end up finding comfort in, in drugs or alcohol because it kind of numbs the reality. 
It becomes this thing that we, could, we can try and, and we can pour ourselves into this and we can forget all the other struggles. And this will bring satisfaction until we find ourselves down this long, twisty road of life and frustration. You see, what Elkanah, while he is a good man and a righteous man, what he's trying to offer her as a way of escape is a false savior, is a false hope. But this is the good news. The story changes coming out of verse 8 and going into verse 9. And if, if we read through this quickly, we, we miss this change. So verse, verse 9 says, And after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Circle that word rose. She got up. The meal's over. The feast is over. And she's been depressed and she's been upset and she's not been eating and she's been weeping. And understand that that subtle word rose or got up. It's more than just meals done so she got up and went into the living room and watched TV. As she says rose or, or got up, it, that word is, it's, it's a... It's a word of taking decisive action. She had made a decision. Things were going to change. She was not going to live like this anymore. So what changes? I'm glad that you asked that. We see the answer here. She goes and after that says, Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. So we are introduced to Eli, who we'll see more of next week. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow. Okay, so again, like put ourselves in this position, okay? Feel the, 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 the intensity of this, this woman who, who feels like she's lost everything, doesn't have anything, has no hope, has no value, and she's been going through this. This other woman keeps provoking her, and she reaches this point, and so she goes to the temple. I mean, she's weeping bitterly, and she's breaking herself down before God. And it's, it's just this 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 intimate moment. And Eli's off to the side and he's watching this take place. And we see the, the I, I think, a, a huge key to this story in her vow. It says, oh, and she said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. <clears throat> Let me keep reading, and, um, and we'll come back to this. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman, and Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled as a, in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as worthless woman. For all along, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have that you have made to him. Now she is so broken. It says that she's speaking all this stuff in her in her heart. I mean she's she's mouthing these words, she's having this intimate, intense conversation with the Lord. And Eli is observing this. And what he thinks is taking place is some crazy woman, some crazy drunk woman has wandered into the, the area there and is praying and he starts calling her out. He's like, hey, you need to lay off the wine, lady. 
here's some coffee, sober up. But I want you to look at her vow. The recorded, now I, don't, I, I guarantee you that there's more to her conversation with the Lord than that one sentence. But what we have, what is recorded, what we see here in 1 Samuel speaks volumes. And she said, when she said that part, she goes, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me. Circle that, those two words, remember me. This, this is a dynamic realization that Hannah has come to. When she says, remember me, what she is saying is, I know that you, the God of the universe, the God who created all of this, the God that created this majestic beauty, this all-powerful, all-knowing God, I realize now that you know me, this broken, insignificant woman. That you know me. That you will remember me. And then she goes and she makes this deal, this vow. And she says, listen, God, if you give me a son, then I will return him to you. End of verse 11, she says, and no razor shall touch his head. And basically what she's saying is, I commit him into this Nazarite vow. If, I don't know if you guys recall, we talked about a Nazarite vow when we talked about Paul in the book of Acts. Acts 18 verse 18 references Paul. A lot of us, when we think of the Nazarite vow, we think of Samson, right? In the Old Testament, Samson with the long hair and all that good stuff. Some of us remember and think of John the Baptist, who in Nazareth was a Nazarite, or took the Nazarite vow. Here, here's what's interesting. We're not going to go into what all the vow entailed. If you want to know more about the vow, go back later today or tomorrow and read Numbers 6, and it will describe what was entailed with that vow. But typically, most of the time, those who took this Nazarite vow, they would take it for a, a season. Typically wasn't considered to be a lifelong vow. The significance of this vow, though, is what she's saying is, I'm going to, if you give me a son, I'm going to bring him to you, literally. Like, I'm going to bring him to the temple, and he will be raised there. Understand what 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 this means, this, 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 this prayer, this vow, as Scripture calls it. What she's saying is, if you give me a son, all those things that um, I claim to, to lack because I don't have a son, the, the security, the, the, um, the labor in our family business, the one who will one day take care of me, the one who, um, who will um, uh, help me out emotionally, like none of that will be there for her. He will, he will for all practical purposes be removed from the family and raised in the church. That's a, while she does pray for a son, the tone has changed. Her mindset is different. She remembers, she knows, she's, she's of the understanding that, wow, even in the midst of this, in the midst of who I am and what I am, and all the things that I lack, God still knows me and loves me. And if you choose to, God, give me a son, then he's not mine. He's yours. verse 18 after she straightens Eli out <laughs> on what he observed and Eli told her to go on her way that the Lord would grant her her petitions 
Verse 18 says, and, and she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Again, this is, I think, a key statement in this, in understanding this passage. Un- underline that, that verse, that the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She's no longer depressed. She's no longer um, bitter. She's no longer broken. She leaves. She, was no, she wasn't eating before. She was crying and she was weeping. She's no longer crying. She's going and eating. Her face no longer looks sad. She looks happy. She's rejoicing. But understand, understand, this is, I, I believe, key to this story. Her mindset has changed, but the circumstances have not changed. She's not pregnant. She's still without children. According to the the standards of that day, she still is insignificant. Yet she leaves rejoicing. Verse 19, and they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. They, all all of them, not just Hannah, they all rise early in the morning and worship the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Samuel for she said, I have asked of him from the Lord. We, and I am so guilty of this. I don't know about you guys, but I personally, Chad Clement is so guilty of this. I don't like to wait. I like the instant. Like I, I'm the guy, I have that Kruig thing in my office for coffee because I can have a cup now and not have to wait for the whole pot to brew. Right? I, I, that's, we do, I don't like to wait. But, but notice here, I love how verse 20 starts. It says, in due time. In due time. You know what that means? It wasn't instant. <laughs> time would pass. The circumstances don't change. But Hannah's mindset did. She's still able to rejoice even though she's not pregnant, even though she doesn't have kids. Why? Because she knew the Lord was greater than her needs. She knew that her stability, she knew that her significance, she knew all of that was wrapped up in God. And once she grabbed a hold of that, it changed everything, even though the circumstances didn't. Verse 21 says, Then the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the, so the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her all along, or along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. And then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, As you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord was granted, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I may that I made to him. Therefore, I have let him I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Um I I don't know about you guys. I I I suspect 
um, we've all been guilty of trying to make deals with God. Um, and for some, that, that Powerball number is pretty big. And you think, man, you're all right, God, you know what? Listen, God, you know what? If you let me win this $500 million, I will give you 10%. Right? You can have that $50 million if I get the other 450 Some of us, man, we're better. We're more spiritual. And we're like, God, I, I will double it. I will give you 20%. Right? I mean, isn't that the way it ends up being? A lot of times we get into this deal and we begin praying for the things that we think we want and need and we begin to try and make deals with God. One of the things that we can't take away from this story is that if I pray hard enough and I try to have enough faith that God's going to give me what I want. Like, that's not what this story is trying to teach us. That's not what's the root, that's not what the, the, the teaching point, that's not what the purpose of the story is. The purpose of the story is to remember that God is enough. <laughs> well, I can only imagine what it must have been like to have wanted this for so long and prayed over this for so long only to finally receive it, to care for it, and then have to take that journey and give your son back to God. And that's exactly what she does. I, uh, found this statement that I think matches this story perfectly. It says this, faith means rejoicing in God when our dreams are still unfulfilled and resting on God when life is still falling apart all around us. Let me read that one more time. Faith means Rejoicing in God when our dreams are still unfulfilled and resting on God when life is still falling apart around us. Isn't that what Hannah was doing? When she finally got up from that table, when she rose and she got up and she made this decisive decision to go forward and she comes and she breaks down before God and she makes that vow, she at that point Point, whether she has a child or not, she is resting in the hands of God. While we quickly move past the character of Hannah, I want us to understand that what, what's at play here, I think is significant on a few different levels. One, when we look at this in their age, the thing that Hannah is wrestling with is the same thing that the nation of Israel is struggling with. One of the things that we'll see coming up here, Hannah felt that her security and her significance would be found in a, in a son. Because everyone else had one. Israel. Israel, at this time, is being led by judges. They don't have a king. And we're going to see soon that there's murmurings of this desire to have a king because all the other nations around them have kings. And they all seem to be doing well and they all seem to be prospering. And there's this idea of security because of this king. And so they begin to cry out for a king. And the answer that Hannah ultimately finds is that God is enough. And the answer the nation of Israel should have found out was God is enough. Let 
let me let me offer these four things real quick. I know time has passed, but our our applications for today. First one is this: Mo- most of our hurt and disappointment comes from seeking another king besides God. Most of our hurt and disappointment comes from seeking another king besides God. If we're able to step back and examine in our lives where the areas of frustration and hurt are, and able to kind of filter through to figure out why we are being depressed and hurt and angry about something, typically it's because our other king is being affected. It, it's, like, it's like this. Um, if you follow smoke long enough, sooner or later it's going to lead you to the fire, right? And for some of us, we, we need to kind of do a little self-examination in our lives. We can see the smoke. We can feel it. And some of us need to step back and sincerely, and prayerfully figure out where that fire is. What king of ours is being burned. And you know what? If I can be honest with you, it's probably a good thing that is being burned. Sometimes God has to do those things to get us back on track. Number two is this, God is better than many sons or a king. Remember that deal that Elkanah tried making with Hannah? Like, listen, just let me be enough. I can be enough for you. I'm better than 10 sons. Israel's gonna cry out for a king and they're gonna get a king. And we're going to find out that king that they got wasn't what they had hoped for. Listen, God is enough. God is enough. Like, it doesn't mean our circumstances always change. It doesn't mean that life gets easy. It doesn't mean that we instantly become rich. It doesn't mean that we instantly have a household of kids. But it does mean that God is enough. That God loves us. That he knows us. That he cares for us. Number three is this, that barrenness does not mean God forsakenness. Barrenness doesn't mean God forsakenness. Listen, you may be guilty of what I'm guilty of at times. That when bad things happen, when when things in life don't go well, I begin to um, instantly begin thinking that God's judging me for something. That it's God's wrath in my life. That's not always the case. Sometimes what ends up happening is then we begin to get frustrated with God and we begin to to, to question God and understand that just because there's these seasons or these times in our lives that are, are barren, it doesn't mean that God has forsaken us. Jesus Christ left heaven to come to earth and to die on the cross. As he hung on the cross, all of those things were on his shoulders. He was forsaken. So we would never have to be forsaken. And then finally this. God loves people the world casts away. God loves people the world casts away. God doesn't see significance typically in the way we see significance. God will never be impressed with the car we drive. He'll never be impressed with how much money we obtain Those aren't things that impress, that doesn't turn God away. But it's not like we're going to get to heaven one day and God's going to be like, holy cow, you made that much money? 
Your house was how big? It doesn't work that way. And sometimes we are guilty of this too. If we are not careful, even in our own self-righteousness, we begin to think that he must love me more than whatever. God loves the castaways. God came and died for the castaways. So this morning, as we're here today, as we look at this story of this woman and all of her struggles, The important part of this story is the woman found her significance, her security in God. For us today, some of us are struggling with that. Life is not playing out the way we had hoped, the way we had planned. Our family situation seems broken. Maybe it's a vocation. Maybe it's our finances. It, whatever we can fill in. Their sickness. There's so much that we can fill in that blank. It just doesn't seem right. And we're battling just like Hannah is battling. At the beginning of the story that we're depressed and we're, 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 we're weeping bitterly and we just, we're breaking down. Folks, listen. We have the chance today as we exit these doors and while the circumstance may not change, our mindset can because we can find all of what we're looking for in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may that be what we hear today. We not focus in on all the struggles of life, but the victor of life, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for what you've done for us. I thank you that you give us scripture like this. Lord, I, I, I know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some that, that can completely understand where Hannah's at, the beginning of the story, and the struggle, uncertainty of life, and questions surround. And I don't think it's, a, it's not wrong for us to, to cry out to you. It's not wrong for us to pray to you. Like, certainly Hannah prayed hundreds and hundreds of times. God, I pray that you help us all come to the point that Hannah did. That our significance, that our satisfaction, that our peace, that our hope won't be obtained in a thing, in a person, in a vocation, in a bank account. It won't be obtained through our health. It can only be obtained through one thing, a relationship with you. The understanding that you are always enough. That you, the God of this universe, the God that just breathed out the stars, that you, God, care for us, love us, love us in a way that you left heaven to come to earth. You lived amongst us. You did nothing wrong. You loved the sinners. You reached out and you helped. You offered this bread, not just an earthly bread, but an everlasting bread, everlasting water. You came. And the result of all the good that you did the result of your perfection, what we did, was mock you, beat you, convict you, 
and ultimately crucify you. But it was on that cross, God. It was on that cross that you died for all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of the barrenness. You were forsaken so we would not have to be. So God, I pray today that you help us. Help us to rest in that. Help us to leave here with the joy that Hannah left. It wasn't Hannah prayed, Hannah got pregnant, Hannah rejoiced. It was Hannah prayed, Hannah rejoiced. And later on, in due time, she was pregnant. So Lord, I pray for those that find themselves in that season of due time. God, I ask you to work in a special way. It's in your beautiful, your precious, your holy, your everlasting, your all-powerful, your all-knowing, your forever faithful name that we pray. Amen.